بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الشرب لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد نبي ورسول ما بعد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله we're here today in the medical center here in Houston Texas what's the name of the medical center Texas medical center Texas medical center in Texas oh, that works It's very intelligent I like that and you're listening to a almost live broadcast because we were live when we did it and we hope we're still alive when you hear it in the future and this is Islam Always we have our website at islamalways.com and this is your host Yusuf Estes the retired national Muslim chaplain and we're here today on the subject we're going to be talking about science the science that we find in Islam and in the Quran and we're going to begin inshallah by talking about something called the Quran by mentioning what is Quran now how many of you are by the way Muslim do we have any Muslims with us today raise your hand Is there any Muslims here well, several mashallah well, let's ask another question is there anybody here that's not Muslim yet not Muslim? How do you like being surrounded by all these terrorists? It's fine. It's no problem. It's fine. Good. It's fine. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, what we'll do then is try to break down each of the words that we use to be sure that you understand what we mean by the word. The word Quran, by the way, doesn't mean scripture, it doesn't mean book, it means something being recited, coming from the root in the Arabic, Qara'a. And this is recitation. Who recites it is a Qari. Huh? And when you order somebody to recite it, you say to them, Iqara. So, recitation, you recite, and a reciter. I, mean, I stress that all the time because a lot of people have a tendency to try to compare the Quran to the Bible of today. On the Bible of today is in written form. That's the only way it's really known. You don't find people really memorizing the Bible in the ancient Hebrew and passing it on. But I would like to mention that that is what they used to do centuries and centuries ago. That is how that the Hebrew tribes used to preserve their work, is that they would write it, but they would also memorize it. They used to bury the scripture in the ground, and then every so many years they would dig it up and have a festival, and they would, you know, uh, compare, they would have reciters, and they would be sure that they compared with what they had. So similarly, we find that the Quran is like this, that it is memorized and then it's passed down generation to generation to generation. And it remains exactly the same today as it was at the time of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. That's, by the way, one of the miracles of the Quran is that it's preserved exactly after 1400 years in the original language of Arabic. The majority of Muslims, by the way, today, some people say 88%, some say 85%, doesn't really matter, but the vast majority of Muslims on the planet are not Arabs and don't speak Arabic language. However, they do memorize the Quran in Arabic, even though it's not their language. And they memorize again, as I said, exactly as it came in the original form. Another thing that we find from the Quran is that it is a work of literature in the Arabic language that has no comparison. Even those who are not Muslims, they could be atheists, agnostics, Christians, Jews. Yet, when they know the Arabic language, they very, very frequently use the Quran as a benchmark, something to compare to, because of the strength of the Quran in the Arabic language, the way it presents things, and the usage of the structure of the language itself also the Quran is something that's easy to memorize this is a separate issue by the way because just the fact that it's nice or it sounds good or you know but the idea that people who are not Arab memorizing it has something amazing especially when you consider they memorize the whole thing in my own case 
I was afraid to even learn the Arabic language in the beginning because I looked at a piece of paper with Arabic on it and I looked at that and I said, looks like you can turn it upside down or right side, it doesn't matter. It looks the same. But then one day, it became real important for me to know what's in the Quran in the Arabic. I don't, I, I, I don't want to know the translation. I want to know what does it really say in Arabic. And from that point, when I made up my mind to really try, I used to supplicate, ask Allah to guide me. And he did. And I came across some tapes and a little booklet for that. And within six weeks, I could go through the entire Quran and be able to recite it. Six weeks. Doesn't mean I don't know all the words, because obviously even scholars still are learning words in Quran. But I'm saying that to be able to look at it, and make those little symbols, those little pictures, represent a sound to you, even the sound of a pitch or how long to hold it. So, and it could be maybe because I had a musical background that I know how to read notes. Maybe I was looking for a good substitute for my music. <laughs> There's not too much music in this now. So, alhamdulillah, that's, that's how that uh, got started with me. Now I want to move to the area that I really wanted to talk about tonight. is talking about science and some of the miracles. Today we have a tendency, as people usually do anyway, in all ages, but I have a tendency to believe that we're already at the highest place people could go. Very, very seldom do you find people really looking forward to like they're going to know so much more in the future. We feel like we know it all. All there is to know. A hundred years ago, at a patent office in Washington, D.C., they were talking about patents and somebody said a hundred years ago, everything that's going to be invented has already been invented. That's how sure people are that we've got everything. And so we might feel the same way today. But also we might not realize things that we had in the past. You know, where our science came from, for instance. I'll give you some examples of it and see, see how it affects you. I think most of the audience here has uh, been in some form of education. Everybody here has a degree in something or going to school, right? Yeah. Okay. So, we're familiar with something. If I mention the song, I, maybe, even though maybe you don't like me, you might find that you know this song. It's called Pomp and Circumstance. Everybody know that one? How about if you hear it? Bom, 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 bom. Bum, bum, yeah, over and over and over. They play it for two or three hours straight. When? When you graduate, right? You walk across the stage and you get to take the tassel from one side, put it on the other, you get the little scroll in your hand and you graduated, right? Well, that's strange because, believe it or not, some of that comes from Islam, not the music part. And he said, what? I'll, I'll bring stuff in a weird way. I could just tell you, but it's no fun. It's more fun to watch your face. The black robe, where did this come from? Do you know? And then, what do you call somebody after he completes his degree, when he comes back, he's one of the people who has graduated from the college. He is one of the Alumni. From what word? Show me the word in English this comes from. Alim. It's Arabic. Someone of knowledge. The diploma itself, when they put it into your hand, that diploma, where does this idea come from? You know? It never existed before the great uh, reign of science in Spain didn't exist. There wasn't such a thing as a diploma like that until the Europeans visited Spain and picked that habit up from the Spanish Muslims. Does anybody know what it was? In Arabic you call it ijaza. You know what's ijaza? When somebody completes a particular course, for instance, um, you memorized all these hadith and the scholar says, okay, now I give you the permission to go out and teach. Otherwise, they used to forbid anybody to teach until you had this ijazah. And that today is equal to the diploma. So, I'm giving you this idea so that you can make a, 
a comparison and a contrast between what we have today and what Muslims had a thousand years ago. And while I'm on that subject a thousand years ago, Islam was well established a thousand years ago. Very well established. Islam was going out into China, to the east, all the way over into Morocco in the west, and into Spain, and into Turkey. Right? Alhamdulillah. But along with it went something called knowledge. And the people of those days were very interested in expanding their knowledge. And they began to translate some of the old Greek works, things that were done in Greek and, and some Latin, but mostly the Greek works from Plato, Socrates, things like this, and study their teachings and then compare things from that to the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith of Muhammad Wasallam. And they made a lot of amazing discoveries. One of the discoveries, of course, everybody knows that in Plato's time, people considered that the earth was basically flat. They had a lot of strange ideas. Hydrology, for instance, in those days was considered to be simply the wind blows the water and it catches some of the foam or the waves and the wind picks it up and just kind of like blows it inland and becomes clouds and falls down. That's what they figured. But the Quran explained hydrology in details about evaporation, condensation, even the formation of the hail and when it goes up and down how it creates lightning. Something not known until just a couple hundred years ago when we began to develop the form of the science of meteorology which, by the way, doesn't mean to study meteors and study weather. So, what I'm telling you about is a particular period of time and a place. I'm talking about Spain, predominantly in this little talk. But I'm going to slip around the corner and go to Egypt for a minute in this talk and look at what they had a thousand years ago. Approximately a thousand years ago. Instead of having a flat rock and saying this is what the earth looks like, they had a round globe in Al-Azhar University. A round globe a thousand years ago. It had drawings on it representing continents. And by the way, it's not exactly right because Florida points straight down instead of out to the side as we know it today. But not too bad for somebody guessing, is it? Which indicates, obviously, that the Muslims had been traveling to some extent at least. Otherwise, they wouldn't know this. But how did they get the idea that the world was round? And in the Quran, we find Allah saying that. That the earth is turning. Turning. It's also mentioning, though, that the sun is in an orbit. Now, people could have thought, well, because most people thought that the sun is going around the earth. Well, we find today that the sun is in an orbit, a big orbit. Just as our moon is going around our earth, our earth is going around the sun, the sun also has something out there somewhere that it's going around. It's in an orbit. These are amazing things when you begin to add this up because you've got to remember that this is coming 1,400 years ago in the desert in Saudi Arabia from a person that could neither read nor write. Solo life, so peace be upon him. Hmm. Earlier today we were over at the University of Houston and I shared with them and I'd like to share with you something that amazed me the first time I discovered this thing. Because each person when they come in Islam they feel like they're discovering the world. And you are. You're discovering your world. You're discovering your purpose of life. You're discovering who is your God. You're discovering what He wants from you. All of these things you're discovering. So you feel like a, a pioneer or an explorer. And it's good. It's very good. But one of the things that came to me and it's just so profound and those of you in the medical field especially in dealing in gynecology or embryology you'll be surprised, unless you know about Islam, to find this was all mentioned in the Quran 
1,400 years ago, and actually some of what you use today in medicine is coming from